I'll sort that out. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you again for your patience as we work through the technical difficulties here today. Yay. Yes. Yeah, round of applause for uh, Greg and all the help. Appreciate it. <laughs> My name's Ariel. I am one of the founders of a company called Stagpoint Cloud. Uh, quick survey, anybody heard of Stagpoint Cloud? Cool. Any Stagpoint Cloud customers? Users? I got a teacher for you. Come later. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, today's sponsors, uh, also Sysig. Uh, I'll spare you the brief on them because they're here. They're going to talk a little bit about what they do. They're going to show us a little bit about their open source tools today, and thank you very much for Squarespace for having us back, uh, and Greg for uh, coordinating uh, around here. Next month, this is live, it's limited already, uh, you're getting kind of early access to it, you go to the meetup page next month, on the 12th we'll be at HBO, they're going to be talking a little bit about uh, auto scaling uh, and how they handle it there, and we'll also have Mark McBride from uh, Turbine Labs is going to talk to us a little bit about some traffic management strategies for uh, Lyft's Envoy. Uh, so really cool stuff. If you're anybody playing around with this deal, show up hands. Yes. So uh, if you have it, I highly recommend you should. Uh, and this will kind of give you a little preview of some of the cool things that you can do uh, there. All right. QCon Europe. Let's let's keep the raised hands going. All right, I'm, I, I'm always surprised. So uh, I'll be there. Uh, hope to connect out there. If not, uh, main second through the fourth, uh, consider uh, Copenhagen. I've never been to Copenhagen. Should be fun. Here's a lot of that. Cloudflare, uh, Argo Tunnel, Ingress. I was talking to somebody earlier about Ingress. If you have multi cloud needs or Ingress challenges, uh, we partnered up with uh, Cloudflare uh, to work on what was previously called Warp, but just got rebranded uh, Argo Tunnel. We're looking for partners, so uh, if you have uh, some interest, uh, go ahead to that link, that Bitly link, or I, I see you with a camera. Hopefully, it picks up that I'm playing around with a QR code. Did it work? Did it work? Did it get it? No? Yeah, works. Works? I know it's all right, a front row of breaks, but, uh, but so the, the link will either come up to me afterwards. First up, from Sysdig, we'll have Michael, and he, again, he's going to be telling us a little bit about some of the open source tools that they have at Sysdig uh, for um, troubleshooting containers. Uh, afterwards, we're very excited to welcome back Dan, an uh, early member of the community. Uh, to tell us a little bit more about where they're at with Buffer, a uh, cool New York company. You guys, New York, you started in Europe someplace, right? But yeah, you we're, we're, remote, New York? we're remote. You're totally remote. remote, totally remote. So you guys are in the cloud? Yeah, or? pretty much. The <laughs> <laughs> cloud plays Buffer with uh, some staff in here in New York. Um, thank you all very much for your patience this evening. I'm gonna get out of the way and turn it up to Michael, who's going to talk to us a little bit about troubleshooting containers. Where'd you get that Twitter handle for me from? Oh my god, I didn't update. It's not <laughs> yours. I apologize. <laughs> Typo. Good catch. Yours, yours is the one on the left. All right. Important information. All right, let's hope this works. No jinx. How many people have heard of Sysdig before? Now, everybody's hand should go up, because he just mentioned us. <laughs> so a few of you. Uh, how many people have used the open source tool to troubleshoot a problem running on system? All right, so a handful of you. So, or not a handful, two of you. So this will actually hopefully be an informative uh, presentation for you. Uh, so I'm going to jump between slides and demo. Uh, if the demo goes south, as demos often do, uh, then we're just going to do slides. Uh, but wish me luck. 
So uh, Sysdig builds what we call the container intelligence platform. Uh, what that means is we have some products uh, that we put under this umbrella uh, of container intelligence. Uh, we have a product called Sysdig Secure, Sysdig Monitor, and then an open source tool called Sysdig Inspect, which is a GUI for opening Sysdig captures. And if you don't understand what a capture is, uh, I'm going to explain that to you today. Uh, it was founded by a gentleman by the name of Boris uh, uh, Pop. You want to do this one? Egiani. Yeah, it's easy. Uh, I always have trouble with names, so uh, I always refer to my Italian to pronounce our founder's name. Uh, Sysdig is an open source project is how we started. Uh, we started in 2013, and there's been about a million downloads of the Sysdig open source tool. Uh, and it's really built around the same concept that we have with Wireshark. Who's used Wireshark before? Yeah, a lot of you. Me as well. Uh, Wireshark was the tool, the go-to tool that I would go and grab uh, when I was standing, sitting in an airport uh, on an unsecure Wi-Fi connection and uh, my flight's delayed and I want to see what everyone's doing on the network. <laughs> Uh, another cool thing, who's ever heard of Etherpeg before? Nobody. So Etherpeg was a cool tool that used the same concept of Wireshark that would sniff a network. And so it would be really cool that you would run it at like a conference during a talk or something like that. And what it would do, it would sniff the wire and it would see all the JPEGs or GIFs or PNGs that were being sent over the wire. And then they would just pop up the PNGs and the GIFs and the JPEGs on your screen for you as they were being pulled in over the wire. And so you would see that when the uh, talk got really boring, uh, a lot more images started flowing through. Uh, so if the talk gets boring, we start to see lots of images going across the Wi-Fi. Uh, we have about 300 enterprise customers, and we work a lot with companies such as uh, Red Hat, Docker, uh, Kubernetes, Community, Mesos, and so forth. So. Uh, just to kind of give you a landscape, and then we're going to jump right into the open source. Uh, so we have our commercial products, and then we have three different open source tools. So Sysdig and Sysdig Inspect are kind of uh, sister projects of one another. Uh, Sysdig uh, can create captures and read captures and give you a lot of information, much like what you can do with TCP dump. Uh, and then Sysdig Inspect, think of that more like Wireshark, where you create the capture, uh, you pull it back onto your workstation, and then you use Sysdig Inspect to get more information out of that capture, and it's a GUI-based tool, and it's a little bit more user-friendly. And then Falco is a tool that uses the same concept that Sysdig does of capturing system calls on a system uh, to basically write, write rules to say, if I ever see system calls that look like this, then notify me somehow. And that notification be, can be something like sending it to an ELK or EFK stack, uh, sending it to a Slack channel or whatever notification you would want uh, that you could create. Uh, so, slide you want to take a picture of, uh, link, useful links to our open source projects. Uh, so our GitHub repository for Sysdig, Inspect, and Falco. Uh, they are open source projects and we encourage uh, contributions. If you want to know more about where we're thinking about where we need contributions and what things could be useful, if you're looking for a project to work on, uh, find me afterwards and I'm happy to talk and give you some suggestions of where I'm, uh, what our roadmap looks like. So Sysdig is all focused around this idea of troubleshooting and forensics uh, for systems specifically focused on containers. Uh, it has a powerful uh, filtering language a la TCP dump. You can do real-time troubleshooting and you can do also offline troubleshooting as well. And I'll show you an example of both. The way that architecture works is right now, uh, we have a kernel module that you put into the kernel. Uh, that kernel is basically taking a stream of system calls and puts it into an event buffer. Uh, and then there's a few other libraries that are used to actually go and create capture files, do some filtering, uh, and then the command line interface or the command line user interface uh, is provided at the system level. So, uh, basically what happens is you install it, uh, of course the way you install it is curl sudo bash, right? Uh, or you can you know, download an RPM from a repository as well. Uh, and then you load in the module and then you have Sysdig working and you can begin to create captures of your system. 
So filtering is kind of the key for using Cisco. Uh, it's very, very similar to what you would do with TCP dump. And what you do is you filter events. Uh, and these events are system calls. And so some examples of events are things like a file was open, a network connection was open, uh, a command was executed. Uh, basically, system interacting either with itself or interacting with other systems. And those are things that would all have to take place uh, where you would have to go and talk to the kernel to have those, uh, those actions take place. Uh, if it's code that's inside of your own code, like in your Node.js application or your PHP application, that isn't making a system call, like opening a file or opening a network connection, we don't necessarily see that unless you add in a special feature known as tracers. I'm not going to talk about tracers today, but if you're looking at trying to trace and troubleshoot your own application, uh, tracers is what you would want to look at with Cisco. And then you have operators. Uh, where you have fuel classes first, and then you have these operators. And these operators are things like equal to, not equal to, uh, greater than, less than, and so forth. Contains is actually another very, very useful operator that you can use. So let's take a look at what cystic output looks like, and then I'll jump into a demo and give you uh, some examples. So uh, this is basically the raw screen. We can see here that a process uh, that was running on CPU1 that executed at this time, a process named HTTPD with this thread ID uh, accepted a connection. Uh, and then this is basically the open, and this is the return. So if you're familiar with programming, uh, functions have where you open it, and then you return it, and you get values back from the return. And sometimes when you call the function, you're going to pass in variables. And when the function returns, it's going to pass variables back to you. So you can see here that HTTP accepted a connection from a particular IP address to a particular IP address, uh, and then some more information as well. And then you can see here that we're going to read from that connection, and what we're going to read is we can see the raw data that actually was passed over that HTTP connection. So we see the actual git, the file that was requested, uh, the protocol version that was being used, user agent headers, and so forth. Um, and here's a little bit of a guide, and I'll post these slides later so that you can use them as a reference, but a guide to what each field means. Uh, I'm trying to advance slides. It doesn't work because it's not quite done. So what can you filter? So these are examples of events that you can filter with Sysdiv. Uh, so you can see open, close, read, write, uh, kind of all the common I.O. type operations uh, that you would want to filter out. And then uh, what field classes can we look at? So there's a whole bunch of different fields that you can use to filter on. Uh, process name, information about file descriptors, and file descriptors are probably the most common one that you would use. Uh, it's a common one that you would use because most applications that you're going to be troubleshooting are going to have a network connection open. And of course, on a Linux-based system, uh, network connections are a file descriptor. And so file descriptors have a whole bunch of different types, like IPv4 connection, IPv6 connection, uh, and so forth. We also have some uh, events for Kubernetes and Mesos as well that you can filter on. So you can say, uh, I want to filter on a particular operation that's taking place in a particular name, namespace in Kubernetes or a particular pod, uh, uh, and so forth. I keep trying to use this. I should just plug it in because I'm going to keep doing that. Maybe. There we go. Uh, so file descriptors. So this is probably the one that you're going to use the most. Uh, and here's some good examples. Uh, not only what you can actually filter on, but some examples down here. So you can see, if I want to filter for all IPv4 connections, then I just need to say, show me all file descriptors of type IPv4. If I want to see all layer 4 protocol of TCP, I could do UDP, I could use uh, ICMP as well, then I could filter out that source IP, destination IP, source port, and so forth. Much like we can with TCP dump, right? So I'm seeing some droopy eyes, so let me change into uh, a demo reference. Why did this not do what I wanted it to do? It's the theme for today. Yeah. Big enough for the people in the back? All right. Uh, so if I do a Docker PS, I have a whole bunch of containers running. 
And I should have one called Nginx running. Let me just make sure. I do. All right, so I'm just going to start a capture real quick. And I start a capture by running the sysdict command as root. Uh, and then I just need to give it a capture name. So I'll just call it kdus engine x dot scap. Uh, and I'm just going to drop that in the background. And then I'm just going to do a curl to localhost, and it's running on port 8081. And so I just got a page back from Nginx. So nothing too exciting. Uh, let me foreground that process I just backgrounded, and I'll kill it. So let's begin to dig through this capture. So if I run sysdig, let's do the example that I just did. And I'm going to give it the file name that I just created. And I want to say fd.type equals ipv4. So what should I see here? Anyone want to guess? A connection from localhost, right? Yep. Yeah. So. I actually see a whole bunch more than just a connection from open localhost. And why do I see more than just a connection from localhost? Because I have a lot more things running on this. So let's get a little bit more specific with our filter. So when I created the capture, I wasn't very, very specific with what I wanted to capture. So what it actually did was it captured everything that was running on the system. So what I could do when I create the capture is I could be very specific and I could say, only capture things from processes, name, nginx. And then that would boil things down, uh, uh, or filter things down so that I'm only seeing the nginx connections. So let's do that. And proc.name equals nginx. As soon as I spell it right. And so now I can see here all the connections that Nginx opens up. And so I can see here that I've got the accept, uh, and I can see it come from, well, it's not coming from uh, 127.0.0.1 because we're using Docker. So it's coming from this address, open to port 80. And then I can see here the request that comes in, and I can see that the git was sent, uh, and I can start to see some of the headers. Now, I don't see all of the information that was passed. Uh, so, a lot of you have used, have used Wireshark or TCP dump in the past, and so much like Wireshark or TCP dump, you need to specify how long you want the buffer, uh, how long of the buffer you want to take. And so, because we have a lot of data that we've sent across the wire, uh, we need to say that we want a longer, what we call a snap length, or size of the buffer. So much like you can with Nginx, or I'm sorry, with TCP dump, you would specify a dash S, and then the size of the buffer, and then you would get more information from the protocol stream that you're sending across. Uh, you also can see the response from the server. So you can see that the server wrote uh, the 200 message. Uh, and if I continue to go down, you actually see that I went and served a particular file, uh, index.html. So let's take this just a little bit further, and let's look at this capture again. like misaligned on my keyboard for some reason. All right, so let's say croc.name equals curl. And now we can see the other end of the connection. And we can only see this because we're running on the same host. You can't necessarily do this if curl is being run on another host and Nginx is running on another host, and then you're not going to be able to piece those two together yet. That's actually one thing that uh, we want to add in, is the ability to merge captures, uh, which you can do with Wireshark and TCP dump. And so I can see here that uh, curl was started, that I have the actual execution of the command, and I get a lot of information of where this command is running from. Uh, and so I can see that it's coming from this SSH client, and I see the other session information as well. And if I go down, so this is a lot of information. So let's do something a little bit more. So let's ask a question. Let's say I want all files that curl opened up in Etsy, right? So would curl ever open up files in Etsy when it executes? Yes. Well, the obvious answer is yes. But let's find out. 
And so you can see here that I went and you can see all the files that were opened up by curl in Etsy. So of course it's opening up um, uh, the linker cache. Then you can see here that it's opened up NS switch. We should also see things like resolve.com opened up and so forth. We see host opened up. Uh, and so this is an easy way for us to get all of that information about what files uh, curl is opening up when it's executing and so forth. So this makes sense? All right. So let's jump back over to the slides. <coughs> Uh, so I already talked about this, so I won't cover it again. Uh, so let's look at Cystic Inspect. So Cystic Inspect is a, a tool that we launched, or that we project that we launched back in uh, the summer of 2017. Uh, and to kind of tell you a little bit of our mindset of our CEO, uh, he wrote this on vacation. Uh, so he's one of those uh, gentlemen who will go off on vacation and will have this great idea and then just spend his entire vacation going and writing a tool or adding into one of our tools or something like that. So what Inspect is, is it gives you all these different what we call views, uh, and then it gives you these tiles. And the thing that's really powerful about Inspect is that you can overlay these tiles. And so let me just show you that quickly. And I, unfortunately, I can't make the font bigger, so you'll have to bear with me. And so if I go to overview here, uh, and I, what this is is a WordPress application. So I can go in and filter out some information. So let's first go and say, show me all the processes that were running on this machine when I took this capture. And we'll get information of like, dur during the duration of the capture, how much CPU was used by each process, how much memory was used by each process. The other thing that you'll notice, what container was this process running in? So we'll have this information about what containers we're running on the host as well. I could even look at it from this perspective to say, all right, show me all the containers that are running on this host. And then if I wanted to, I could go in and say, all right, so let's drill down into the WordPress container. You can see all the processes that the WordPress container are running. And of course, this is running uh, Apache. So there's a lot of processes that are running. And then what I, if I wanted to, I could say, okay, for this container, Show me all the files that were opened by this particular container. And you'll see this little breadcrumb as I click through these views. You'll see this breadcrumb trail kind of walk out. The other interesting thing that you'll see, that if you don't always know what filter that you would want to apply to a capture if you're working on the command line, the interesting thing about Cystic Inspect is it'll give you the actual filter that we're using here. And so I can see here that uh, we've opened some stuff under uh, var www html and I could actually go into this individual file and I could say, okay, show me the actual IO stream. Oh, that's not what I wanted. One of these this will work for. Uh, huh. One of these is the work for. I, I think I'm in the wrong capture. So I'm in this container. I can also see the I.O. by type, right? So there's different types of I.O. So if I'm trying to troubleshoot a problem, and one thing about troubleshooting that's really important is you have to find what path you want to take, right? So if you're trying to troubleshoot an application and you're not sure why it's running slow, is it running slow because of network activity? Is it running slow because of I.O.? What you could do is go in and drill into I.O. by type. And I can see here that uh, most of our activity was taking place over an IPv4 connection. Uh, I can also see file activity that took place. And if I wanted to drill down further, I could see, OK, well, what processes were doing the file activity? Since this is a WordPress container, it's, of course, going to be Apache. And I think the thing that's most powerful about Inspect is this ability to go and overlay different pieces of information. So I can say, show me all the HTTP errors that took place, and then show me all the file open errors that took place. So I can see here that there's a bunch of HTTP errors and file open errors that seem to be happening at the same time. And then what I could do is drill down into one of these particular, that's not what I want to care about. 
throw it at this one. And so I can see everything that was happening during this, this is really hard for you all to see, but during this 819 milliseconds on the system. And so if I had a particular event that I was trying to troubleshoot or if I wanted to see uh, what was actually happening when a command was executed, I could begin to drill down and get very, very granular uh, uh, with, my, with my search. I could also see things like uh, server ports or connections that were opened up uh, during this time as well. And I can see what commands were actually opening up those connections as well. Make sense? Yes? Could you go back to the previous view where you have the HTTP file errors? So theoretically, you can click on the HTTP errors and the file open errors and probably do some application failure correlation. Yes. You can also, so in this case, uh, so the question was, is, um, that's a good point. That's something I skipped over. Thank you very much. I'll give you a sticker afterwards. <laughs> so any of these tiles you can actually drill down on. And so if I click on this drill down, I can drill down and I can see the actual reads and writes that were taking place. Uh, as promised, the sticker was delivered. Uh, and I can see the actual type of HTTP error that was actually happening at that time. Uh, Another interesting thing that you may not necessarily think of uh, is process errors. So who's ever had to troubleshoot uh, odd errors like uh, file descriptors running out, right? And you may not necessarily get an error message in your application. You might just be told that can't write a file or can't open a file, right? Uh, what you can actually see are the process errors that are taking place, and you can see here that I had 48 different errors taking place. If I drill down into this, I can see what type of errors that were being thrown as well. And then, uh, unfortunately, we don't have a go Google this error, but then what you would do, go and do is go and Google that error and understand more <laughs> why that error is taking place. And you go to, what is it, Stack Exchange, and. Uh, another interesting part of Sysdig uh, is that we have these things called chisels. Uh, chisels are essentially what makes those views possible. Uh, it's a script written in Lua, so if you were looking for a project to uh, contribute Lua to, uh, or a chance to learn Lua, this would be a great project for you, uh, who's not looking to write more stuff in Lua. But what it allows you to do is aggregate, analyze, and report on a sequence of events. And so those views that we're actually seeing is actually we're just executing a Lua script on, uh, on that capture or on that data. Uh, so let me give you an example of a couple different ones. So if you wanted to see all the HTTP requests, you would use HTTP log. Uh, if you wanted to see top processes by CPU or top containers by CPU, then you can use that very easily. Uh, and it'll give you that information. Uh, there's a whole list of these. So if you just wanted to reference them quickly, uh, they'll be in the slides later when I post them, and I'll tweet them out. My Twitter handle is right here, uh, and I'll post them on uh, SlideShare uh, after this. So one other thing in the time that I have left that I wanted to show is that you can also look at Kubernetes information. And so the one that I always like to show is, because I think it's pretty powerful. So if I run csysdig, so csysdig, is a live tool, kind of like Inspect. Inspect, we can't run live. But this is um, a curses based tool, and I gotta zoom this out, or otherwise, that's not what I want to say. Well, for some reason, it doesn't want me to zoom out. My terminal is angry at me. Maybe it's a user error. Yeah. Did you say yeah? I, I, <laughs> all right, so I can look at information that's going on in the system. I have the same types of views. So if I wanted to see all of the containers that are running, I could go in and look at those containers. Uh, and you can see we've got several containers running, 22 different ones. Uh, if I wanted to see, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, I can go in and say, show me all of the Kubernetes pods that are running. And in this case, I don't have any Kubernetes pods. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring one up quickly. Uh, that's not bringing it up, that's actually deleting it. <laughs> All right, and then I can do curl localhost, and there is nothing running on localhost, and that's fine. Um, but what I wanted to show was if I go and drill down and look at my views, And uh, what I wanted to show is if I go and look at yeah, processes. Oh, I can't find it. Um, anyhow, we'll, we'll skip this and I'll show it to you afterwards if you want to show it. Well, what we can actually see is the protocol interaction between Kubernetes and other services like Docker. Uh, so if I wanted to drill down and see what was actually happening on the system, I know how to do it now, hold on. So if I go and look at uh, Echo, I can see all the protocol streams that are happening and uh, going through here right now. And if I go and look at, um, Oh, I don't remember the filter. I actually have to look at um, the actual pipe that's being sent, and I forget the actual file name, uh, and you want to filter on the particular uh, Unix pipe that's being used between Kubernetes and uh, Docker, and I forget the actual name of the file. But you can see here, we see a lot of that information going back and forth when I look at this F5, and I can see all of the information that's taking place for a particular process. Uh, I can look at Hypercube and the API server, uh, and I can see all of that traffic that's taking place between Kubernetes and uh, anything else that's running on the system as well. And so you can see the actual raw protocol uh, going across. You can see me getting nodes, uh, and checking in, and so forth. You can use all of this data to then go and do a filter uh, you see some of these coming across where it's actually modifying an endpoint and so forth. Uh, you can use all of that information to then go and filter and troubleshoot why Kubernetes may not be interacting correctly uh, with another system or another API or so forth. Uh, so I'll be, yes, question. Can you capture from there? You can, you cannot capture from there, you have to capture from system. But you do can capture the Kubernetes metadata. So if you wanted to go and filter on a particular pod or a namespace or something like that, uh, you can do that very easily. So in the minute and 25 seconds that I have left before Ariel kicks me off stage, Let's talk about what Falco is. So Falco is a behavioral monitor tool, and so it'll detect specific, suspicious activity defined by a set of rules. It uses the same filter language uh, as Sysdig does, uh, and it has full support for containers and orchestrators as well. So you can alert on Kubernetes metadata, so a particular pod does something, or if you want to then, uh, if you see uh, abnormal activity, then you can also include the Kubernetes information in the alert that you send as well. Uh, so things like a shell was ran inside of a container, right? Uh, system binaries were overridden. Uh, somebody tried to change a container namespace, probably trying to escalate uh, privileges of a container. Uh, Non-device files were written in root. So things that people do to often to try and hide things. Uh, and we shipped 25 different rules out of the box that are kind of focused around these kind of container best practices. And so the way the rules look, you can see here uh, the rule for right below a bin directory. So we have different macros. And so basically what will happen is, is this expression here will get substituted and replaced here. And so basically, if anything in this directory uh, is open for writing, and it's not by a package management process, then we need to throw this alert that says a file below a known binary directory was open for writing by this user, by this process, and that's the name of the file. If you run it in uh, Kubernetes output mode or container output mode, then we would also add in other fields in here as well. Um, 
you have any other questions, uh, I'm here. Dan and Derek are local to Derek. Wave, wave Derek. There you go. Got to teach them how to interact with people. Uh, they're both local to New York. Uh, I'm actually based out of Ohio. Uh, and as I said, my Twitter handle is up here as well. So thank you very much, and I'll be around for questions later. Thank you. Well, thank you for setting up. If anybody has like, a question, you should probably shoot at yeah. Uh, are you? What are you? Is someone in the back? No? No questions? All right. Yeah, you get it. <clears throat> Did your academic system call? Uh, what's the overhead? Um, so for in both passive mode and active mode. Yeah. We tend to find it pretty small, usually under 5%. Uh, in the commercial tool, we actually cap it so it doesn't go ever be up above 5%. Uh, in the open source tool, it can actually take over a system, but we tend to find that fairly rare, uh, unless it's a really, really, really busy system. And if the system gets overwhelmed, what we'll start to do is drop events from the event buffer, uh, and just not add the events to the event buffer. So on an overwhelmed system, you could actually lose system calls. So, but if I had this, let's say, on a live system that I want to turn on and off, because I want uh, I have a production system. I don't yeah. want it to affect performance, but I may want to be able be able to turn it on when it's in an idle mode. Yes. Say what's the cost? Uh, it still has to go through every event. Very, very minimal. So we find it about 2% CPU. Dan, did you want to add something? Yeah, I just want to add that normally you would have some type of alert or event. Normally, you would have some type of alert or event to cause that capture. You wouldn't have it running the whole time. Your age is pretty small. But it's only during the time of the cache, which is typically like five seconds or what have you. So yeah. there's, there's not much impact. You're not having it run throughout, right? Yeah, and the other thing is, is you want to try and filter as much as possible to try and um, keep your captures as small as possible, because otherwise you can get a very, very large capture very, very quickly. Thank you. Thank you. And if this stuff is interesting to you, uh, this is kind of a, 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 a short, a brief introduction into a workshop that we look oh, yeah. to, yeah, you want to say it or? Oh, yes. Uh, so we're, we'll be announcing it, uh, hopefully with Ariel and others, that we're going to be doing a workshop. So we have, we've done these uh, in many places. We're doing one at KubeCon as well. So if you're there, look into it. Um, but we're doing like a four, four and a half hour workshop about using the open source tools. Uh, and giving you lots of real world examples that you can walk through to use the open source tools. And hopefully we'll be doing that in New York, hopefully maybe the week of the 16th, April 16th. Uh, and we're doing one in Minneapolis on Thursday. If you have anyone that you know in Minneapolis, I can't. Is the April one, is it, do you have to register for it? What are you gonna have to pay for that? Uh, we have to find a space. Uh, so also if you're willing to host and have room for 40 to 50 people, then talk to me afterwards. Uh, we think we might have one or two options for space, so that's the last thing we're waiting on. And then we'll send it out via the meetup. So, thank you. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> Next up, Dan from Buffer is gonna give us an update on what they've been up to. Hopefully you guys see the video I sent out of him presenting at KubeCon a year and a half ago now. November, uh, the last election. Seattle. Last oh, election. yeah, that's right. Yeah. Seattle. That's, that's, why I remember November. <laughs> yeah, that's how I remember those two come forever. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Well, uh, thank you. All right. Uh, I uh, just want to kick this off. It's not going to be super as technical as, uh, as the last talk, but I want to give a high level overview of where we're at after two years of using Kubernetes in production. Uh, I guess just to kick it off, I'm curious, because uh, I haven't been to the last couple meetups and a lot of faces here, uh, how many people are using Kubernetes in production right now? Good. How about, uh, how about been using Kubernetes for over, let's say, you know, a year? Okay. Okay. And how about a couple years? All right. All right. Cool. Cool. Yeah. No, I mean, there's been unbelievable growth. So uh, 
just want to gauge where people are at and everything. So uh, please stop me if I just kind of go over something, throw a question out there, something that you're not sure of, uh, depending on where you are in your uh, Kubernetes journey. So uh, to kick this off, uh, tonight what we're going to cover is just a quick thing why we chose Kubernetes. Uh, a timeline of our journey with Kubernetes so far, where, we, where we've been, like what interesting things that we've done uh, that we feel are interesting to us, and uh, what's kind of coming up for us next, uh, what some hopes and dreams are, and just like a couple quick pieces of advice, things that we learned that we just wish we kind of knew early. Uh, so to go on from there, uh, you're probably wondering who is this guy? I know he said it's Dan. I'm Dan Farrelly. Uh, I am the Director of Engineering and Technical Lead at Buffer, and Buffer, if you're not familiar with it, because uh, if you're not in marketing or customer support, you may not be, uh, Buffer is a, we're a software as a service company, and we build a suite of products that are used to help small businesses grow. We focus on publishing content, analyzing performance, and replying to customers across social media platforms. So if you're starting a company or want to do something like that, check us out, buffer.com. Um, and uh, I've been working and focusing on our long-term project, as you can see it's still going, uh, to move from our legacy monolithic application architecture to a microservices architecture. Uh, it's kind of been at various stages of velocity and excitement in the last couple of years, so it's still going. So to help understand a little bit about some of the reasons why we chose Kubernetes, I wanted to show uh, about our team. So Buffer is a completely remote company. Uh, there's a couple people, one of them's here, and he's based in New York, uh, but we are a completely remote company. We're spread across 10 different time zones. Uh, we're 70 people and growing, and it kind of our remote nature, and uh, there's no real hub or office, so our remote nature kind of drove us and influenced us a little bit about why we chose so, real quick, why we chose Kubernetes, uh, we decided that it was time to uh, change our architecture, we weren't adapting fast enough, uh, we weren't innovating fast enough, and we were also moving towards a single product company to a multi-product company. So, early on, we were thinking, how can we iterate on product faster, how can we share core services uh, across products, and like increase developer velocity. So we decided to change our architecture and adapt. Uh, we were moving, you know, our, most of our legacy environments were on AWS Last Beanstalk. Our, we didn't really have any ops people on the team on board, mostly just product engineers. So uh, we were lucky enough to evaluate a few different things in, I'd say, spring to mid 2016, and Kubernetes had just released uh, 1.3, I think in July that year. And uh, they were really adding a lot of great features every single release. It had an awesome community, and things were just like, you know, it felt like it was early stages of like just doing, jumping on a rocket ship. And uh, our, our kind of, our, our big thing was with our remote team and not having an ops team, we wanted to remove everything. I mean, we were used to uh, Elastic Beanstalk, which abstracts everything away from you. Uh, we really wanted to drive our self-service DevOps, kind of no-ops uh, vision for a remote team. Uh, we need something flexible, fast. We wanted to empower anyone in any time zone, 24 hours a day, to deploy services and not require a DevOps person to hold their hand or do it for them. So over the last two years, all these things, these reasons have held true and are still drivers of why we use Kubernetes. So jumping into a timeline, uh, just want to show a couple like learnings of what we've had over the last couple years, and you know just show how we util utilize Kubernetes and what it offers. So really, they in, 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 uh, in the beginning in mid 2016, we were at baby steps level. Uh, we kind of started kicking the tires. When we were starting to spin up services, we weren't really sure how to how to manage them. We were you know using the docs and using you know, Kube, CTL, Create. Uh, we started to collaborate uh, in our in our team. We started just creating our service file, all our resource YAML files, and sharing them in some private repo and a private Git server. And 
it was, you know, kind of, it was like a backup, it was some way to keep guitars and collaborate. It worked to, to kick it, to start, uh, start things off. So we also kind of realized that with, like, this pattern was gonna be great. Uh, with a bunch of developers having Kubernetes API access, it's kind of like level security wasn't really something we were okay with. Kind of just gave too many people too many credentials and too much access. So uh, we also had zero automation at this point. This was slow, but we were learning. So fast forward to fall, we started putting things into production uh, and really throw, like, take services and deploy them and whatnot. Uh, we still use this main cent uh, centralized private repo approach with all our YAML files to keep the team in sync, basic con configuration. To automate a little bit of this, we just use, this is pre-helm days or pre-helm two days, so we use the uh, kubectl patch and we just patch for new new image on, uh, into our deploys, in, into our deployment files. And uh, one challenge that we, uh, that we at least, one challenge that we had was that repos got out of date, so we were collaborating on files that were in this private Git repo, but then just using patch, so, or someone was using kubectl scale, things were just out of sync, and you know there was no single source of truth other than what was on the cluster, so our massive YAML repo started to get out of date, and it just creates some janky workflows and everything. Um, but even just bringing this minimal uh, automation with kubectl patch into our workflow, it just accelerated our Kubernetes adoption, building new services, and deploying code way faster. Like we, you know, we got a little, uh, we drank the syrup and we were feeling good. And, you know, we, we started to get a little bit more opinionated, which was good, like we were in that phase. So just kind of at this point, like we were just sold. Like we were, <laughs> we were, you know, just real powerful, like real productive, like, you know, just like Patrick Swayze, Braxton Tai Chi and Roadhouse right here, just like, Oh, we were just feeling good. We were like, oh, we, we made the right choice. We're making moves. And we were sold on Kubernetes. We were still beginning. So fast forward, jump to 2017. Helm 2 gets released at the end of 2016. Uh, Helm 1 was, I think, not Kubernetes compatible at that point. Uh, and y'all are probably familiar with, with Helm these days. Uh, I'm going to show hands who familiar with Helm. OK. Helm is a, uh, is a package manager for Kubernetes, which does all sorts of things, which allows you, uh, you to uh, create, uh, basically templatize a lot of your YAML, uh, your YAML files and your configuration for your deployments, your services, everything, and uh, to distract that process away. So instead of patching things in production and changing one field at a given time, uh, you can have a raw configuration and pass values into this template and generate a new file, uh, in so, like to a, to a source file, and apply that to your cluster for updates. So it, it can change, it does many things, but it can change how, it, it changed how we started deploying code. And it was the biggest, I think, uh, change that we had for, as we were deploying services. So, Please ask me questions like as you know goes on or, or later in the talk. Um, we at a Kubernetes meetup in New York. We, uh, I saw a great demo by the Deus team, which now got uh, now is part of the Azure uh, Kubernetes team, and it was the demo was unbelievable. What what was possible and uh, what could be done on a CI CD platform, and it just kind of had had a soul on the team. Uh, we decided I'm using some terminology. Uh, a chart is a is what uh, Helm calls a a template for a service, basically. Uh, so that's that's what it calls a, a uh, its its main resource that it uses. So uh, yeah, using Helm and using its templating features, uh, we started taking our configuration files, our YAML files, templatizing them, and putting them in each. Uh, services repo on GitHub. So we were each service. The our configuration was close to the service itself now, and we could see the configuration adjust. If we were scaling something, we could change the value in the repo itself in the YAML file. It would be applied to the cluster. So there was less of this 
uh, someone adjusting something on the fly and then you know going back to the source and not having you know this this uh, original YAML file that we created uh, be the uh, yeah sync basically with what was in production at that point. So uh, we really uh, used this to streamline our deployments. We started adopt you know a lot of these things allowed us to do uh, start bringing on continuous deployment, which accelerated a lot of our, our processes were uh, were like at that point. Uh, we started also doing using some of Helm's features. Uh, we were able to uh, start doing on-demand uh, staging servers for each branch that we uh, created on GitHub. So this was an idea that I'd seen before and had seen uh, Dan, the Dana's team at that time demo, and it was unbelievably powerful. We started using uh, ingress, ingress controllers and adding ingress entries so that uh, each branch had its own unique URL and it, everyone's uh, container was out like once they pushed the github it was out in a couple minutes and they could it really increased our product development time and our QA process so there was no before we had a lot of like fighting for dev servers these big chunky environments now we were just automating the heck out of everything and just really putting developers mind at ease not having you know reducing the amount of things they had to do manually so um, Helm overall just gave us a lot of flexibility it's just unbelievably useful, and uh, it just it, it changed our our twenty seventeen our trajectory. So we uh, we started also using uh, Cops, which is a tool we run on uh, Kubernetes on AWS. So we use Cops to manage our clusters at this point instead of using the previous iteration, which was uh, Kuba, which is a popular usage uh, you know, way to deploy to Kubernetes. I mean, uh, to Amazon and. Uh, so we got a lot better at that. This, this bottom in the corner is the branch subdomain. You can probably just type the random things and get to our, get to uh, find some staging servers right now. Uh, <laughs> but repo is also open source. So a lot of this, I can send some things after this. Uh, we're a very transparent company. If you have heard of us, it might be because of that. Oh, spent too long in this slide. Uh, oh, all right. So. We, uh, I can send around some repos and examples of what we have. A lot of our code, we're just trying to make everything that we can transparent and public repos on GitHub so everyone can see how we're doing things. And please give us feedback if you think we're doing things wrong, because we love that. Uh, so we got really close to like kind of use the full power of Kubernetes this year. So on a quick side, jumping out of the timeline, I just wanted to show what our kind of deployment pipelines were looking like at this point, and still look to today. So. This is basically how we're deploying code. So what we have here is uh, our main deploys are, are triggered by opening PRs and the branches grabbed or merging PRs when the when master is updated. So we have events coming in from GitHub and we have uh, manual uh, kind of triggers coming in from our team on Slack using our bot, our in-house bot. And this triggers events to some service that we have running which we just refer to as the brain, which here is shown as a Krang from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I don't know if you ever watched that. It's great, he's evil. Uh, he's basically a brain. I don't know how he exists, he has hands. Uh, it's, it's pretty wild. But uh, so anyway, this is brain service. It kind of knows, it has the database, and knows what to do with these events, knows what repo is coming in from, what's deployed, where to go, what commands should do what, where, you know, what cluster is what on. So, but it doesn't have any configuration, all that's stored in each repo. Uh, so what this does then is trigger our, our, our man Jenkins over here to build the images and push them to Docker Hub is what we use. And then we have uh, services on each cluster which actually uh, send the events and use either Helm or still some legacy services use uh, patch commands to uh, update that service on each cluster. So this allows us to kind of have a a way where we can decouple, um, you know, each uh, each Kubernetes cluster uh, and how each uh, how all our code is, is deployed there, and also it keeps the security credentials for who has access to the uh, Kubernetes API inside the cluster itself. So there's a limited, like, uh, you know, things that this this can do. So rather than Jenkins itself uh, communicating with the API. Correctly. 
So uh, if you have any questions on that, please let us know. The code is not ready to be open source, but uh, you know, if, if, you want, if you want access, we'll, we can probably open it up. Uh, <laughs> so where we're at now, uh, right now we are running three clusters in production. There's like four at this exact moment, but we are, it's three main clusters. We have a, or something that we keep up to, uh, to date as much as close as possible with uh, stable Kubernetes. So we're running 1.8, uh, which has all our, uh, our has a dev namespace, and we use lots of namespaces on there for various workloads. And we throw everything on our main cluster. And we have a 1.3 cluster, which uh, we created in 2016 and really botched an upgrade at the end of 2016. So we just kept that cluster as it. <laughs> so that's a stack. But you know what's amazing about it is that 1.3 is still so stable for us. We, we don't really do add too much to this cluster, but it's been so stable that we don't really need to worry about it, and it just really kind of uh, made me feel good inside about choosing Kubernetes. So, uh, yeah, so we also have some other cluster that our data team uses for all sorts of kind of jobs and pipelines and whatnot. Uh, so they're kind of managing their own stuff, sometimes using uh, uh, Google Kubernetes engine or just using COPS on AWS. I'm not sure at this point, they just change their mind every week, which is fine. Uh, so, you know, we, uh, we uh, we definitely see the stability of what we have right now. I mean, from fall 2016, we had one service in September, uh, and then a handful that fall. Now we're running like any any time 140, 160 services, uh, 700 to 800 pods may be large or very very small, depending on what type of business you run. Uh, and we're running on roughly our main production clusters are about 30 nodes in total. So. Uh, yeah, so that's what we are, where we are right now with that. Uh, we are dead focused on moving everything in our legacy setup to Helm. Uh, and we're also using it to make it like a really, really cool tool. I think it's still in beta, but it's working for us. It's, uh, it's called Arc, it's by the company Peptio. And we're using that to back up, like to create backups. Yeah? Have you had a chance to look at case on it? Sonic. Uh, I do, I have read the docs, but I have not used it. I think I, uh, I did use it once on my, my laptop, but uh, we haven't used it. I think the things that uh, Helm did for us were what we needed as a team. So uh, that does look very promising. It's another tool by uh, Heptio, which is, pre which is pretty sweet. Uh, uh, K Sonic. Yeah, Heptio is a great team. I think they're uh, former core uh, Kubernetes creators. Craig McClough, Craig McClough. Uh, and Joe Beta. And Joe Beta. Uh, plug for them. Yeah. And, uh, what are you backing up? Huh? What are you backing up? We're backing up all our deployment files. So in case of disaster, like a, a cluster fall over or you know major disaster, we can, you know, uh, one of our things that we had with our YAML massive repo was it was a configuration for every service. So we felt like we could, in a short amount of time, spin up another cluster or do something and use that single source to, to create everything. But uh, with Helm, we have templates of what the state was at various times, which could have you know, come out different ways depending on what the last state of the cluster is. Um, so our, what it can do is it can grab uh, the state of your cluster, services, deployments, uh, various configuration secrets, and it can back it up into something that you can basically resurrect your entire cluster uh, from this story. So we use S3 to hold all our uh, our ARC uh, backups, and we do that daily. So we haven't had to use it, but we've tested it a little bit. So I'll mention that a little bit later. But again, we are not in a gigantic workload. Uh, some of y'all might make it bigger. So you know, this is, a, this is our use case. Uh, and I think just a little bit about where we're headed right now. Uh, so where we're headed right now, uh, one of our biggest things is charts. And for those uh, that I mentioned earlier, they are the construct that Helm uses. And uh, 
our main thing is, is how we're configuring our, our services and we're using charts. And we had some challenges with keeping our charts and, and uh, our main configuration for how our services are, are, uh, are configured inside each service repo on GitHub. Um, we started, we're feeling that now where that things are getting fragmented, as we're continuing to learn, uh, we, best practices are evolving and core things are changing. And it is finding it hard that everyone is changing their configurations a little bit different, all their helm charts a little bit differently. And if we want to adapt or change something, it's, it's now we're scattered everywhere where we had one centralized repo before. So uh, we want to be a little bit faster. So one of our, our, our new initiatives that we're doing right now is creating our own company standard uh, extensible charts. So creating some really boilerplate standard stuff like a web service or uh, a worker, a cron job, various different things like this, uh, the reverse proxy. And we're going to create a lot of these things that are extensible and configurable uh, in Helm with, uh, with values. What basically Helm does for those who don't know, you pass values to your template and you can over and you can set a base set of like values and override what you want to do. So we're very, uh, we're very focused on that. Uh, we're also trying to use this to, you know, distribute our best practices, like using health check sidecar containers. Uh, we're using some of those because we're starting to use Istio, uh, which was mentioned earlier. Uh, and, you know, we bake in these, these best practices. You know, things like we're using, uh, we run on AWS, so instead of giving everyone AWS keys, we're starting to use a, uh, a service called Coop2 uh, IAM, which allows you to use IAM roles instead of issuing uh, keys and secrets for each service. So to rotate keys, we're starting to use Coop2 IAM. So it's a more, of a, it's a very manual process right now, pushing out these updates and these these kind of best practices out to all our services. So this, we're hoping that this is really going to help our our. Our workflows, and we also have, a, you know, in each repo now we don't have as much configuration. It's just the values, what you want to apply to the service, what you want to apply this template for help. So, um, we're also last thing. This is kind of new. It's in rapid. It seems like rapid development right now. It's an open source project called Chart Museum, uh, and if you're using help uh, to and you're consuming these charts, these templates, standard services. Um, you need to host them somewhere, you can. Um, so Chart Museum is this great project that we've experimented with a little bit and we're, we think we're gonna just roll out and fully adopt uh, to, it's basically like a repository, like a Docker hub or, or a Git repo, uh, like a GitHub where you can push all of your Helm charts right to, uh, right to there and you can manage those and store those on an S3 bucket or some cloud storage backend and uh, allows you to kind of push and pull your repos and manage versions and everything. So if, if you if you are using Helm, please check that out. Uh, it's pretty awesome if you haven't heard of it. Um, so the other part of where we're headed is uh, cluster operations and changes to our cluster itself. We are using Istio, which is a hands for Istio. Okay. Uh, Istio is this awesome add-on that you can you know, deploy on top of Kubernetes, which is a, which is a, uh, it has multiple, probably gonna butcher this, so please Google this after. And, uh, but it is a service mesh, and it uses multiple components which you can run on top of Kubernetes, which gives you, gives you, extends Kubernetes to do many things that Kubernetes doesn't do outside of the box. Uh, you can secure service to service traffic, so one pod can only talk to another pod. So, you can divert certain traffic from one uh, one pod coming from here to another uh, deployment over here, another service. It gives you incredible control over traffic that's happening on your cluster. So it is it's something that you know is unbelievable. I think it's on like a point four release right now. It's still moving quite quickly. Point, point but, seven. What is it? Point seven? Yeah. yeah but uh, <laughs> but uh, it's it's really it's really awesome, and I think it's going to be one of those like Kubernetes standard things that everyone's going to be using. Uh, but uh, like Ariel mentioned earlier, like uh, using Stackpoint Cloud, like you can 
you, you're going to want to experiment with it and really see what uh, what it can do. So, you know, another thing that we want to do is uh, Jaeger is a tool, I believe, developed by Uber. It has application tracing and it works well with Istio, so you can pull in tracing. Uh, it can send tracing data, so we can have more insight from our developers. Uh, our developers, so they can see, you know how application tracing is happening in between different containers and pods, giving us a little bit of insight. So we're really trying to uh, like adopt that and work, make it easier for our developers to adopt these things. Uh, Jaeger, and, and, and this might uh, require some code instrumentation, uh, but we're trying to figure out ways to make that a little bit better. Uh, and you know, just for us, our, we're trying to kill our legacy cluster, just jump in on our one main cluster and probably bump it up towards 50, 60 nodes by the fall, uh, which isn't massive, but uh, it's, it's a pretty good size and should be able to take all our workloads as a company there. So uh, we're also planning, with, like I mentioned, with ARC, uh, planning to spend more time on disaster recovery so we can bounce back after downtime. Um, I can try to, um, I'll, I'll speed it up. I know we're getting late. Uh, Long term Kubernetes outlook, uh, with our uh, no ops kind of vision, we don't want to be the average developer to have access to the cluster. We want to fully automate that, restrict that, keep it secure. Uh, we want everyone to configure their applications and their services with well documented Helm charts. They just need to throw us the values of what they want to configure, click something, and the deploy goes out. Fully automate that. Uh, we, we don't want someone to have to use the CLI or need cluster access to do these things. Uh, we, like I mentioned before with Jaeger in, uh, in the previous slide, we want to provide more visibility into each service so the developers deploying code in Sri Lanka can get the same benefits and understand stuff so when the people wake up in London, everything's fine. They don't need to wait on anyone. No one's a blocker. So we want to start improving our monitoring around all these things. So. Quick advice, and this is maybe like, you know, starter stuff, some people might have very different opinions on this, but the things that I would recommend are learn vanilla Kubernetes first, you know, kick the tires, you know, for all the regular vanilla um, cluster, or use Minikube or something, and then definitely, like definitely use Helm and look into Istio, like they're very beneficial. Uh, and one thing that bit us in the butt real early. Uh, Kube DNS, we didn't have auto scaling on. Um, when we deploy new services, throw a bunch of traffic at it, we would, you know, we, we ran into a, a few issues. So I would recommend you pay attention to Kube DNS, show us love, monitor it, throw, if there's an auto scaler that you can deploy on there. Uh, and also, we botched really, uh, you know, our still running 1.3 cluster. Uh, practice upgrading clusters, use something, learn how to do it better. Uh, do them off and figure it out. Use tools, use an off the shelf service or some third party uh, scripting, you know, whatever you need to do. And the last thing is just resource limits. Uh, use resource limits, use resource requests. That's how Kubernetes knows where to put pods, where to run containers. If you don't and something has a memory leak or uses, abuses CPU and you get podged, evicted to another. It, it, we've just seen a lot of things. Just like make sure that everyone uses resource limits. <laughs> just, just, just please do that. Uh, you'll be happy. So that's it for me. Uh, I covered a high level journey. Uh, I know there's various levels uh, in the room right now. So I hope it gave you some ideas or uh, you know inspiration or things maybe you disagree with. So any questions or throw it there? Yeah, uh, let's make time for one question. I also want to highlight uh, a couple of things. Chaka Hepian, are you a know, Hepian? Is that, is that oh, the label you guys want to yeah, He's lead, develop lead developer on Sanbui. Uh, yeah. Sanbui, which is for conformance, uh, but you can probably talk to him also about ARC is in beta, or where's ARC at? In the... uh, yeah, not, not 1.0 yet. Not 1.0 yet, yeah. Um, That's good enough for us. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, question? Any questions? Got one question? Yeah. All right. So, what's your view on? So, you said try some vanilla Kubernetes, but for whom within the organization? What's your view, especially going forward, on how much Kubernetes developers should know? Because I've heard lots of different opinions from, hey, the whole point is developers can like yammer themselves to heaven. 
<laughs> or the whole point is that as we get good at this, developers should know nothing about this and then we need an abstraction layer on top of it. And then the question is how do you implement that abstraction layer? Do you use Helm? Do you use CRDs? Do you use something else? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, this is definitely opinionated and it depends on your team, I would say. Uh, for our team, because we don't really have a, like, we don't have like a DevOps cluster kind of operation that like background. We never had any uh, like really key people on the team that were very great and stuff. Uh, a lot of our team leads like le really leans front end or full stack. So our choice in that pattern or in that, in that thing is to uh, is to use tools like Helm and uh, abstract as much away as we can. Um, and also, we're not doing super crazy things. We have a lot of like services that are just HTTP services, and you know they're running you know running Node or PHP in a container, and if it works locally, you know we can we can deploy it. Like we're not doing some crazy stuff. So I think when it comes to that, we are trying to abstract. We're going the pattern of abstracting as much way, but I think it really depends on your team. So yeah, it depends. Like I'm, you know, I'd love everyone to know how rock like everything about Kubernetes and it's not terribly, I don't think, difficult for people to learn. It's just time consuming, I think, depending on you know where you're at as a company. Hope that helps. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I think we're hiring in the middle of this year. So we didn't hire last year. Come and check us out. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and and I want to thank both Dan and uh, Michael from Sysday, two great companies. Uh, Sysday have been great partners to the lead up in the last couple of years, and uh, Buffer is one of my favorite uh, startups of all time. Their levels of transparency, not in sharing, not only in sharing what they're doing in infrastructure, but across the board is really a great model, and I, I highly recommend you both take a look at them uh, in, uh, across all fronts. Uh, so. Thank you. We have the space for a little bit more time. Uh, you can grab these guys. We're running a little bit late. We want to make sure Greg gets home at a decent time. Uh, so if you want to uh, grab these guys, ask a couple questions, we'll probably have about 10, 15 minutes. Is that right? Yeah. And then uh, if you want to go grab a drink at a bar nearby, Lime Tiger up on Bleaker is a great bar. I suggest you to partner up and uh, find some places to go check. Thank you so much. See you next month at HBO. I think I might see it. No, I don't know. I watched it. 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 I think it does. It certainly is in the decomposed mode. Yeah, it's in the what's three main consult three or four consultants. Well, yeah, it's a lot of centralization from the main George. George. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm working at it. Yeah, shoot me an email. Anytime. Uh, okay. Yeah. What is it? Definitely, I've seen some of those videos. We have one guy that's watching it all day. All right. Yeah. And.